Hey, good people. In our lecture today, we are going to be talking about um, how we respond to some cases of human diversity. Now, I don't want you to get all uh, wigged out like, oh my goodness, she's getting ready to talk about the cultural diversity stuff. We have to have an understanding about something good people. We have to have an understanding uh, in regards to when we are getting ready to help others, we have to have an understanding about what our foundation is. What are our values and our beliefs? And so when we talk about it, when we mention the term diversity or cultural diversity, it's not intended to invoke a spirit of or a, a feeling of um, being invalid or uh, to create a, a feeling of defensiveness, but it's uh, intended to uh, encourage us to actually think about what we're thinking about for us to evaluate our very own foundation um, and think about things as we progress through our interaction with others, but also helping us to be mindful that everyone that we work with may not be privy to some of the things that we're privy to. They may not have access to some of the things that we have access to. And so we have to have an idea of what does our profession say about working within diverse populations. So when we talk about diversity, again, it's not just in regards to uh, race or ethnicity, but as you see here on the slide, when we're looking at diversity, diversity comes in many, many different forms. Uh, diversity, uh, we look at diversity based on gender, based on sexuality, based on income, based on race, based on our abilities or our, our inabilities. We have to know that when we're talking about gender, I'm sorry, not gender, when we're talking about diversity, you see this last bullet down here, we have to be uh, courageous enough to acknowledge the isms that are in place. The isms meaning that there was once, or there is, I should say, a system of uh, power and control. If we think back to intro to sociology, uh, we learned that the sociologist, Robin Williams, said that uh, when we look at the way society functions, our culture here in the United States, we value group superiority. And so we have to get an understanding about what that means, group superiority. And when we think about superiority, we're thinking about someone or a group of people who are the majority, a group of people who are the standard setters, okay? So when we get down to the point where we're talking about the isms, whether it is racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, homophobia or heterosexism. When we're looking at the isms, we have to be able to define what that is and how that's impacting our client, consumer, or patient, but also the perspective that we, the worker, are then going to take in working with our client, consumer, or patient and addressing the issue. And when I talk about the perspective, what well, we've been talking about all semester long, conservative, liberal, or progressive, okay? So our book gets into uh, giving us a lot of definitions with some terminology. And you see here, you see that here on the screen. But the ones that I want to kind of uh, point out and highlight are going to be this, uh, this one here, number four, or the fourth bullet, I should say, prejudice and discrimination. We have to have an understanding about what those terms mean. Prejudice is going to be the thought process. Discrimination is going to be the action. Yes, I can say that I have prejudicial thoughts about people who wear blue. If you got on blue today, don't take offense to that. You know I'm liking you from afar. But I can say in my thoughts, I don't like people who wear blue. It be, and that's a prejudicial thought. It becomes discriminatory when I say, the next person I see wearing blue, I'm going to tell them off. The next person I see wearing blue, I'm going to trip them going down the hallway. The next person I see wearing blue, I'm going to, when I get to the place where I'm acting on my thoughts, that's when it becomes discriminatory. When we get down to this point or this term of microaggression, I, I'm hoping that you all have heard this term before, but microaggression, microaggression is that subtle way, it's a subtle way of discriminating against someone. And it may be a way that you're not even familiar with what you're doing. I'm sure you've probably heard folks say this in the past, whether it be a, a journalist, maybe it was an instructor, maybe it was a family member or friend, that someone says, wow, they speak really well to be fill in the blank. Wow, they dress really nicely to live in a fill in the blank. When we talk about microaggression, 
again, it's that subtle way of trying to say, I'm one up better than somebody else. Microaggression can be just as powerful as the full blown act of discrimination uh, uh, towards somebody. So we gotta be mindful about that. When we talk about individual and institutional racism, yes, that does exist. Individual racism, meaning that I personally don't like fill in the blank, someone from this racial category. Institutional racism, we see that played out when we look at, <clears throat> excuse me, housing. Um, if we take the opportunity to um, evaluate housing in larger urban areas, we can see through demographic studies where there may be um, a group of housing that may be predominantly um, uh, occupied by a minority category. And then we look at what the cost or what the housing uh, market may be like in that area. That's institutional racism. Institutional racism would be if I, being a woman of color, wanted to buy a home in um, a neighborhood that was predominantly white or predominantly Asian, and I'd be denied um, that mortgage, or I'd be denied an opportunity to view homes. Again, that's an example of institutional racism. We these are just things, you know, again, we got to be mindful of. Um, I want you to, to take the opportunity and read through this chapter and get an understanding of the terminology that's being, uh, that, that we're being provided with so that you can have an idea um, and an understanding of what your foundation is, okay? The last one I wanna look at is this one down here, the colonialism and the separatism. When we think about colonialism and separatism, colonialism, we're coming together, working together as a group. Um, colonialism, we're building for the betterment of. That separatism, it's all about me, myself, and I. Come on, y'all. Sometimes we got to actually know the terminology so that we can know better in order to do better, right? Okay, so as we're talking about, again, working with diverse populations and diversity in the helping profession, a lot of things that we have to consider are not just um, the way that we interact on a regular basis, but sometimes we got to look at things based on a scientific approach. Okay, and again, when we talk about this field of social work, this is something that you should have gotten in the intro to social work course. But when we talk about the field of social work, we know that it is an umbrella and that it has um, the foundation of anthropology, sociology, and psychology. The study of culture, the study of society, the study of behavior. So when we take a look at the, the way that people function in society, how they make sense of their environment, we get an understanding of, or we can see, I should say, how sociological perspectives fall in, psychological theories fall in place. All of this to say, again, that we have to be able to examine the whole idea of power and control. I know y'all, I know sometimes it's a little off-putting, but we gotta recognize what we need to recognize in order that we get to a place, again, of doing better. So when we talk about power and control, we need to look at it from not just a, um, a social perspective, but a political and a cultural perspective as well. When we talk about the political perspective, and we're going to get into this, when we look at it from uh, um, our uh, conservatives, our liberals, and then our progressives. All of this, again, is wrapping us up to the place of having an understanding of how do we work with, how do we make sense of, how do we advocate for our client, consumer, or patient. One of the last things, uh, or one of the other things I should say that the book talks about is this whole idea right here on this, this uh, bulletin item here, intersectionality. What does that mean to you? Intersectionality. You should have learned about it in Intro to Sociology. But when we think about intersectionality, intersectionality is, I know what it's like to be a woman in corporate America. I know what it's like to be African-American in my neighborhood. Intersectionality comes into play when I say, I know what it's like to be a black woman in corporate America. So when we, again, when we, we're back at some of those uh, terminology, we know about uh, prejudice, discrimination, microaggression. When we're dealing with intersectionality, we're looking at two um, elements of a, an oppressed uh, a group who has, excuse me, a group who may have been oppressed, such as based on gender, based on race, based on lifestyle, based on sexuality, and two of those variables come together. 
I don't know what it's like to be male. I don't know what it's like to be um, uh, in a same-sex relationship. I don't know what it's like to be, um, let me see, what else can I say? Oh, in a Fortune 500 company, but I do know what it's like to be uh, female. I do know what it's like to be African-American. I do know what it's like to be over 50. I'm only 28, y'all. I'm just playing about being over 50. But, <laughs> but I hope you get the point about all of the isms that we have to deal with. So again, as a helping professional, I need you to start to think about these things. Think about what you're thinking about. When we're looking at, again, dealing with human diversity, our response to diversity, looking at it from a conservative perspective. The conservatives are saying, you know what? Everybody, people are people. You know, we, ha we can't rely on the government to dictate or to regulate um, how we're supposed to interact with folks, um, how we're supposed to embrace people. People are people. The liberals are saying, hey, 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 hey now, there is a serious problem with the way our society is functioning as we interact with or as we deal with, as we address some of these isms. We got to do better, people. And then our progressives are saying, whoa, there are too many people who set that standard, who have the power, who don't want to relinquish the power. And we got to figure out how do we restructure what's going on in society? The progressive folks are kind of saying, you know what? We need to put a pin in it in this whole idea about um, valuing group superiority. And we need to kind of lay some things out so that folks have the opportunity to do better, to know better first, and then do better. All right, moving ahead. The book kind of gets into a lot of historical perspectives. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on that in the lecture. So I wanna jump ahead real quickly to this issue right here, multiculturalism. And I need to ask you, like, do you think we still need to have lectures? We need to have courses. We need to have discussions about what multiculturalism is. Have we gotten to the place within our society that you as an individual feel confident that we've addressed uh, multiculturalism in a way that everyone is valued equally? When we talk about multi multiculturalism, again, we're going beyond the concept of race and ethnicity. We're going beyond that. We have to look at, from multiculturalism, we have to look at how is this impacting the whole idea of difference, whether it is race, whether it is ethnicity, whether it is religion, whether it is sexuality, whether it is gender, whatever that issue may be, have we gone beyond it enough that we can say we're beginning to see the impact of social misfunction, that we're beginning to see the impact, oh, hold on y'all, of this last bullet, the economic competition. We got to know that when we're talking about multiculturalism, there is a whole idea of how it impacts our economy. What does that mean to you? And how do we make sense of it? Some of the other issues that we address when we're talking about human diversity as a social worker, we look at immigration, the new immigration. What was the history of immigration? And what are we doing about the new immigration? Undocumented workers. What are we doing about affirmative action? We know all about um, the, affirm the, the uh, civil rights movement. And we know, um, again, coming from sociology, we know about the civil rights movement. We know about um, the education. We know about uh, the, the, the different um, legislative acts that have been passed. But how are we um, acknowledging affirmative action right now with some of the issues that we're seeing when we talk about multiculturalism. Again, we get to this point of separatism, separatism or integration. Are we in a society where we could say we have separate but equal? Are we there? Again, things we gotta think about as helping professionals. When we talk about separate but equal, what did that, what does that mean? When we're looking at separatism or integration, we've seen a lot of this historically throughout um, our country when we're looking at how are we assimilating or how are minority groups assimilating 
to the cultural norm, to the standard. We saw it with Native Americans. When Native Americans, when children were taken from the homes of Native American parents, they were put into a system that was not geared towards their culture. They were taken away from their culture, forced to assimilate to another culture. And what did that do to the family system? When you see here this bulleted item, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, why were they established? Why are they still in existence? Is it still a separate uh, institution or is there elements of integration? This other bullet, the LGBTQ, when we think about the movement, the legislation um, within this current generation that has been enacted for the LGBTQ community, what has that done, again, in regards to issues that we're still working with, that we're dealing with from a social justice perspective? So again, some of these issues and some of these things that we're talking about, these are things that you as the worker need to be familiar with in order to have an underlying, or I should say a strong foundation of how you're gonna be working with your client, consumer or patient. The last thing that I wanna talk about is here, this last um, screen right here, where it talks about knowing who you are. You gotta know who you are, good people. You have to know your likes, your dislikes, gotta know your biases, gotta know your assumptions. You need to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Who can you work with? Who can you not work with? Who can you tolerate? Who gets on your reserve nerve? These are things that you have to have an understanding of when you're getting ready to become that helping professional. And the reason why that is important is because you don't want your personal likes or dislikes to get in the way of your client, consumer, or patient being successful in their treatment while they're working with you. All right. So I hope that makes sense, good people. That is the information from the chapter in reviewing our response, the social workers' response to human diversity. All right. So y'all know my, my closing line. You know how to get in contact with me. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, hit me up by email or you can contact me on my office phone. And until I see you next time, y'all know what's up. I bid you love, peace, and bacon grease. I'll see y'all on a discussion board.